six, we're just flying at about 400 feet and eight knots. And we're going along the uh, north side of the Bredore Lake towards Barra Strait. You can see the shoreline is mostly made up of barrier beaches as shown below and uh, headlands. Uh, this beach is uh, mostly sand with a gravel uh, storm bridge, some gravel lag deposits on the head uh, points, and uh, there's an ephemeral or seasonal cut through the barrier at this point. And as you leave the barrier, you're getting into more erosional cliff, uh, quite sandy, underlain by uh, bedrock exposures, and it appears to be gypsum. You can see how the, the gypsum blocks are breaking off in large chunks. The beach is much more discontinuous along here. Um, it's mostly sand and gravel when it is there. And then offshore, you've got sand, gravel, cobble, boulder uh, deposits. More. The sand is much further offshore than uh, the pebble deposits. And going across another barrier, don't cut through it. It's a continuous fringy beach. The time is 1437. And again, we switch back into erosional uh, cliff and scarp with a bit more continuous beach along this section. But again, it switches back into um, erosional um, cliff with bedrock and blocks uh, dropping down. Much more sand just offshore in this section. Here we're getting back into the bedrock exposures again. Following along uh, towards uh, Jamesville West, uh, there's a very large barrier beach that used to have an opening through it. Uh, it'll be just coming up in the view. Here we've got uh, very poorly exposed, or uh, very well exposed gypsum at the base of an unconsolidated cliff. And there, and then we're just starting to get into this beach now. It's mostly pebble. And cobble and some sand and you see that there's some uh, inlet uh, still attached to it but as we come around we get to the railway bridge uh, the Canadian National at Jamesville shoreline along here consists mostly of bedrock uh, gypsum exposures uh, there's some riprap in the base of the cliff uh, it's been added by the railway Above the railway is mostly unconsolidated, but there is some bedrock exposures. And while the near shore was more sandy towards the barrier, it's becoming more like bedrock. As we follow the Canadian National Railway along, we're into the Horton group of sandstone and uh, conglomerate rocks, shales. You see some uh, uh, boulder riprap has been added to that uh, railway crossing. And uh, the beach along here, there's some, uh, looks like gypsum, uh, deposit just offshore. We're getting some bedrock shores just along here. Very picturesque um, uh, sandstones and conglomerate rocks right along the edge of the railway and artificial rip -rack. Following right along the, the railway follows along this beach. It's mostly a sand beach with some pebble in the storm ridge. There's an old inlet that cuts through to the uh, to the barrier. Come by into Barra Strait. There's some of the highest knots uh, or uh, currents in the in the strait here. We're going by the Highland Village. There's a big festival in August. But as we come across here, it's mostly all a bedrock shore, a very high uh, cliff. Coming up onto Iona, people from the Hebrides uh, occupied this or settled in this area. Got about 30 meter relief on those cliffs, artificial uh, rock uh, along the base of it. At Iona, there's more of a fringy beach at the base of the railway. There's two crossings across Barrow Strait. There's a railway and highway, and the highway. Uh, protected by riprap and the water depths here are about 22 meters below the bridge. There's 
just at 400 feet. The time is at 1441. We're just going by Oyona, by Plaster Cove. And you can see why Plaster Cove gets its name. We're back in the Windsor Group. And you can see the very distinctive uh, white rock, gypsum, and uh, the barrier beach fronting in is uh, gravel and sand like Aspie Bay. There seems to be some sinkholes or some deep areas farther offshore. Very beautiful area. We're getting a good view of the near shore sediments right now. The light colored areas are sandy. You see two bands going parallel to shore and then the darker areas are more coarse material or bedrock. The scarps are unconsolidated, uh, probably about uh, 10, 8 to 10 meters. They got quite a slope to them. They're not vertical, but steeply sloping, probably underlaying by bedrock. Um, and then we go from the headlands with the bedrock and then into these barriers, which highways are built across, um, going across this uh, lagoon. The shores uh, along Grass Cove are mainly gravel in the outer part and sand at the barrier. Uh, the cliffs, 5 to 12 meters. Another uh, inlet coming through a small barrier, mostly gravel, some dune grass on the back shore. As we come up to Grass Cove and Blacksmith Point, uh, again, you get into uh, a more of a, a bedrock shore, uh, gypsum and uh, Windsor Group, uh, Carboniferous Rocks. The shores, again, are mixed sand and pebble. High bedrock, probably about 20 meters. And then you go right into an unconsolidated cliff. Going along John Alex Cove area uh, towards the light at uh, Gillis Point. Uh, it's much higher rock uh, shores. Looks like sandstone, uh, bedrock, Windsor Group. Um, some till, but mostly a very thin sheet over the bedrock falling down, slump deposits. The beach is a mixture of boulders and, and uh, sand and gravel, uh, very poorly developed, uh, it's probably drift aligned all along here. And the uh, shallow water is very narrow uh, just offshore, it comes deep just offshore. It's coming up on the Gillis Point. Gillis uh, Point is a very popular anchorage for uh, sailboats, in the, especially up in McCuskill's Harbor. Uh, as you can see, there's a sailboat there right now. Um, on the back side of the point, uh, you can see there's been uh, riprap added, uh, made by the Coast Guard for the light, and the shores are fairly high on the outer part, and then as we get back into the McCuskill's, the McCuskill's Harbor, they're much uh, shallower, and uh, there's wetland at the uh, head of the harbor. Time is 1445. We're just at the head of McCuskill's Harbor, flying at 400 feet. We're circling around and you get a view of the harbor.
to come around uh, McCuskill's Harbor. Get a good view of, uh, of a yacht uh, anchored in there. Very popular spot, very shallow waters, uh, sheltered by the spit that uh, extends out from the harbor. Coming down this side of McCuskill's Harbor, we've got a higher cliff. That was a great view of the boat, and that was, here's another view of the distal end of the spit. You see the trees along one of the major ridges. There's a building in there for scale, but the spit itself is mostly pebbled. Offshore, you can see a distinct line of what looks to be sand, but just close inshore, it's mostly pebble, very narrow beach with the uh, back shore rising several hundred feet uh, with some landslide or slope debris. This barrier is continuous. There's trees along the uh, south end, but it looks to be overwashed in the central part. Then you return into a more erosional cliff between these other barriers, and you can see the pebble fringing close to the beach. Time is 14.47, just leaving uh, the McCuskill's Harbor area by Ponies Point. As we leave this area, we're heading up into the quartz. No, sorry, the granites. Uh, and we're leaving the Windsor Group for a while. In the meantime, the shore is uh, primarily a uh, unconsolidated uh, over top of bedrock. Still appears to be Windsor Group. Uh, and then this uh, pavement here, you've got a bit of a ba uh, barrier. Uh, pebble material fronting a wetland. Yeah, now I think we're getting up into some of the uh, the quartz. The rock is much whiter color. And the relief here is up around the 150 meter, uh, 500 foot level. As we head towards Burnt Point. There's a very narrow fringe of uh, shallow water. It looks to be fairly well uh, uh, sorted uh, cobble material. And there's some fairly large landslides uh, and boulder material from the side of the cliffs along uh, the beach area. And then you can see some fairly major slips along the top of the cliff, near the top of the cliff. As we come up to Burnt Point at uh, 1449, there's a uh, beach, fairly nice one, uh, facing up towards the other part of the Bredore Lakes. Very well developed uh, sand and uh, gravel beach. There's a road along the top of it, unfortunately. The wetland in behind, there's no natural inlet, but looks to think so. And then as we move over towards Bouquet Point, we're getting more into bedrock again. And probably coming closer to the Horton Group. Looks like uh, more sandstone or conglomerate again. And at the end, uh, McKay Point, uh, elevation about uh, 50 feet, 15 meters. We're getting into, again, uh, unconsolidated cliffs, uh, partially vegetated and stabilized for a very narrow, almost non-existent beach. You see that sand deposit extends around to the wharf. There's a seawall in the back by the road. And then on the other side of the wharf, there's riprap. Um, and then there's a narrow, uh, fringing beach that extends towards that small embayment and then low erosional cliff on the other side. We're just coming up uh, at the top of uh, sort of the wash, wash buck area, wash buck area. We're going to go by uh, Bone Island, which is locally known as Allen's Island very small island. It's almost joined to the mainland by the split uh, Cuspade foreland. Circle around that. And uh, where we've got uh, mostly pebble shores with a cobble boulder lag uh, just offshore and in the lower inner tidal. And the time is 1451. 
heading towards Neal Island and a bit of a causeway that goes out to it. Uh, this shore, there's more relief, certainly uh, probably 50 feet up by where the house is. And uh, the beach is fringing, uh, fairly well sorted uh, pebble, cobble material. A lot of dead trees along the beach, some wharves and 